I'm probably going to, I'm going to teach you a little prayer song. We're going to start with that, and then, uh, and then we're going to go into the talk. For those of you uh, who obviously have seen me do presentations in the past, uh, it's, it's a little different than, than uh, the hosting role. So we'll, it's going to be a little more teaching time, and then we're going to have some questions and answers at the end, okay? So it'll be fun. You should laugh a, a bit. We'll tell some funny stories, but um, this is going to be a great little talk, an opportunity to kind of get... Um, you know, down and dirty about some specifics and ways that we can really live out our faith and the power of the Spirit, especially in this time. So, uh, why don't we get ready, and I'm going to switch mics, if that's cool. If I take off my jacket, uh, are you going to be okay with that? Some of you... (laughs) are struggling being so attracted to me, and I understand that, okay? You don't need to laugh that hard. Thank you. Yeah, that's not weird. So, uh, okay. Oh, yeah. Did he do something? <laughs> you, some of you forget I used to be in rock and roll. I was in a band called Boys to Men. <laughs> Why don't we pray? We'll see if the Lord can do something with me. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. Jesus, I need you. I thank you for today. I thank you for these amazing men and women. We want more of you. So we invite you, Holy Spirit, to teach about the beauty of what love looks like. Teach us how to be filled to overflowing with you. Come, Holy Spirit. Like the idea of 
Jesus inviting his disciples to just come and be with him, to sit, to talk, to laugh. For some of you who have been married for a long period of time, you know the beauty of just being together with someone that you love. You don't have to do anything. You can just be, and it's a beautiful experience. And I think that's what our faith is supposed to be like, just being. And the doing flows from the being. That's what I think. So I want you to listen to this again. Come away. I'm just going to keep my jacket off. Let's just address the obvious problem here, and that is I have a lot of weird birthmarks. And uh, I can't do anything about it. My parents were artists. <laughs> kind of screwed me up as a child. So how many of you have a past? How many of you have been trying to hide your past most of your entire life? How many of you have people in elementary school, middle school, high school that could disclose your past and it terrifies you? <laughs> I think sometimes we wish in a way that our life were different. Sometimes I think that we have these idealized versions of what it looks like to be a great saint. And so we imagine what it looks like to be a great saint. I think you imagine what it looks like for you to be a great saint. What is it? For some of you, it's like, well, I would be praying nonstop. I would spend, you know, countless hours before the Blessed Sacrament. I'd be praying the, the rosary 10,000 times, you know. I and mean, gosh, everywhere I went, people would be just so in awe of my holiness. I would bilocate. I would levitate. I could read people's souls. I mean, you have this list, and the list comes from basically probably saints that you like, the amazing wonders and the things that they've done. And that's your idea of what it would look like to be a saint. But what if, what if what it looked like to be a saint was your regular mundane life? What if that actually was the journey towards sanctity? And you can't imagine it. Some of you have been praying that you could get tuberculosis. <laughs> so you could be like St. Therese. And, but we have all of these bizarre ideas of what it looks like to be a saint. Because, because that's how our saints that we love, that we are attracted to, that's how they died. 
Wouldn't it be great if we could have that same death? And you're, you're, you know, you're right in a sense that it'd be great for us all to have a holy death, but guess what? Maybe a holy death could literally actually be you dying uh, with your family surrounding you praying the rosary. Or maybe a holy death could literally be you, you know, in your bed snoring and dying. I, I don't know how death works. I haven't experienced it yet. But I know it's pretty unique to the person. Pretty specific to that person. <laughs> We have an idealized version of what it looks like to be a great saint. But did you know there's no repeat saints? Not one saint is the same. So we, we have a number of saints that the church has intentionally canonized, beatified. We call venerable. This journey towards, you know, the ultimate right canonization is not something that's just random, no big deal. I mean, I think people knew, right, when Mother Teresa passed away, that was a saint. In fact, many people said that to her before she died, and she would say, well, I have to be dead first in order to be a saint. The reality of sanctity is something that, that is not a surprise. Look at me. You don't wake up one day in heaven like, oh my, uh, how did I get here? It's your whole life. It's what it, it's what it is. Like, you, this is what you've been doing your whole life. Now, there are certainly, I think, some places and ways that we can have a little bit more of a fast track towards sanctity, a little bit clearer path, like avoiding sin and, and maybe having Our Lady help hold our hand and guide the way. I think there's definitely some, some highways when it comes to the, the road to sanctity, but I guarantee you there's a lot of cars on that highway and not one of them is the same. See, I think we have a weird idea oftentimes is that when we hold an idealized version of what it looks like to be a great saint, we don't really live a saintly life. So look at me. If you're holding to a preconceived, idealized version of what it looks like to be a great saint, you will never truly live out the life of being a great saint because you've robbed yourself the opportunity to be a genuine, unique contribution to the family of God. Now, some people get upset and they think, well, like, okay, what does that mean? Well, what that means is that God doesn't manipulate you and force you to walk in the path that is best for you. Now, here's the amazing thing about God. God doesn't, doesn't, doesn't basically give up on you when you deviate from the best path. And I think that's part of the big message here is that, is that when God does a great work, he can do a great work in a variety of ways and circumstances. And because we're human persons and have freedom of choice, there's going to be a lot of different times on the journey that we go over here and over there that was not necessarily the most ideal situation. But we can ultimately know and have confidence that whatever those deviations and journeys and variables along the way, whatever they are, whatever they might look like, God is bigger than any of those deviations and, uh, you know, numerous little bumps along the way. Are you picking up what I'm throwing down? This is a very important principle for us because, because I think God gives us enough time to be great saints. And you might say, well, Chris, I haven't done a great job of being a great saint. I've taken a lot of variables, paths. I've done a lot of things that I wish I wouldn't have. And uh, the truth is, you know, I probably don't have much time left. There's not enough time to be a great saint. Look at me. Look at, look at, look at, look at. Yes, there is. See, part of that is your journey. And none of it is outside of the reach of God. And he can take whatever remains that time and he can use it for the glory of right, of God. And maybe that's part of your journey, is the realization of what it will look like and could look like for you to say yes to the uniqueness of God working in you and through you. See, the reason all of this is a factor, because when we talk about the work of the Holy Spirit, the irrepressibility of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit wants to do something in you and through you, period. And the reason is because of baptism, we're invited into the very life of God. And it's not just a club and not just a gathering of people who share similar beliefs. It's not just a place where we can feel good, but it's a place where this family of God, where we are empowered then by that spirit of God to go out and live. Now, what are we to go out and live? We're to go out and live like Jesus. So look it. Jesus, who's the last Adam, he basically 
fixes the mistake of the first Adam. He comes and he lives out the fullness of what it means to be fully human and to love God in a proper and an obedient way. This is a very important point of the incarnation. Because Adam set us spinning. He and Eve, by that choice, free will, by the way, not manipulated, not coerced, a willing free choice to do something that they know that they were not supposed to do, that spun everything off of its axis. There's no longer unity with God, no longer unity within themselves, and no longer unity within each other. And because of the consequences, the radical, massive consequences of a temporal being, Adam and Eve, offending an eternal being, God. God, who's eternally Father, Son, and Spirit, there's no way they could have just fixed it by saying, I'm sorry. This is the intensity of what we learn in the Old Testament, that sin is severe. It's so severe that it justifies, right, the loss of life. And so animals, according to certain stipulations and, and uh, situations, they would be sacrificed and representatives for the individuals so they could have a time and a period of basically right, passing that guilt, a scapegoat. But it wasn't the ultimate forgiveness. And what God wanted was to teach us that sin is so radical and so intense and so severs us off that main path. It so changes the way that we think about ourselves and others that what we need is to be like clicked back into place and not just repaired, but given a new heart and a new mind. Hebrews 8.10. And this I love is that God doesn't just want to kind of fix this together with twine and, and basically kind of jerry-rig it with duct tape. He looks at you and he realizes, okay, what needs to happen is you need a complete overhaul, a brand new start, a new beginning. And so God looks at you and he says, because you're mine, buried with me in baptism, raised in newness of life, I'm going to give you a whole new way of living, a whole new outlook on life. It is the proverbial rose-colored glasses because you're looking through things because of the blood of Christ that's been shed on your behalf. Not as a scapegoat, as the one, the one who really, in fact, does forgive your sins. Look at me. Look at look, look. Are you tracking with me? Are you following me? Okay, I know you just ate. You're not allowed to get sleepy, okay? The thing about this that I love and which is so important is that Jesus becomes flesh, right? The second person of blessed Trinity becomes flesh. Jesus lives that perfect life in obedience to the Father. As the last Adam, he undoes the mistake of that first Adam. That's why we look at Mary and call her the new Eve, right? The knot of Eve's disobedience is undone by the obedience of Mary, and so what we have here is we have almost like a new beginning, right? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And you have that story. And there's the human person, Adam and Eve. And they make these choices. And these choices have great possibilities or great consequences that are negative. What would have happened if Adam would not have sinned or Eve would not have sinned in that moment? Who knows? This is what's so fascinating. See, Adam was called to tend and to keep that garden. But the truth was, he didn't do his job. He shirked his responsibility. How do we know that? Because Eve is over there hanging out next to the tree. And then there's the serpent. And some people have a real problem with this. Why would a good, loving God allow for the serpent to be in the garden in the first place? You know how the serpent got there? It's Adam's fault! That's how the serpent got there. He didn't do his job. He didn't tend. He didn't keep. He was not responsible. God gave him dominion over all those animals, gave him the ability, right, to do things that really are not understood by us as human persons in the sense that he didn't have any conflict within himself because he didn't have concupiscence, that, that propensity towards sin. He didn't have a disconnect, right, with who he was. He had integrity, he had um, basically, uh, almost at that time, kind of the staid sense of death. So we would call that, that preternatural gift like immortality. And he knew things. And he had what's called like an infusion of knowledge. And because that was happening, he was set up for success. But when the garden scenario happens, that great epic battle between the enemy, when the enemy comes in, the serpent, and he basically taunts Eve and asks, did God really say that you would die if you eat from that? 
there's a, a decisive moment where Adam epically fails. Because what should have happened there is Adam looked at the serpent and said, I don't care if I die this day, but I will defend my bride and we will do what God asked us to do and not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If he would have done that, who knows what would have happened? Who knows what would have happened? Maybe at that moment, all of humanity was set uh, into the beatific vision and that's where we were going to spend forever immediately without all of this other stuff. We don't know. But because he chose sin and she chose sin, what happens is, is that we deviated off course. And it's going to take us covenant after covenant after covenant to realize how severe sin is. Why so long between the garden and the cross? And the reason is that the human person is inclined to forget. The human person, without that infusion of knowledge, now we are mortal, and now we don't have that integrity. With all those possibilities of deviating from here to there, it's going to take us a long time to realize that we were made for something more than just going through the motions and satisfying urges and trying to fulfill what, like needs with wants. Are you following me? And so we bring up that moment, right, the incarnation, because God is not just interested in us going through the motions. He made the human person in his image and likeness as in inviting him into the very life of himself. And so he's going to fix the one thing that could keep us from truly loving him. You could say, well, what if, what if, what if a person was born and did not sin? Could they die for us and for our sins? And the answer is no, because Adam and Eve were born without original sin, and they made the choice to sin. Could Eve uh, have said, I'm sorry, Adam said, I'm sorry, and, and, and then we're all back on track and be forgiven and no big deal? No, because that offense by a temporal being was to an eternal being. You can't just say sorry. Well, what about Mary? Could Mary have been born without original sin, conceived without original sin, and then died on the cross for our sins? And we would be forgiven. Could that have happened? No. Because she's a human person, not an eternal being. See, the thing about today, and this is really important, is that when we talk about the work of the Spirit, it's always going to go back to the reality of Jesus Christ as the last Adam, who's wanting to show the human person what it really looks like to love God, serve God, and obey God. That's why Jesus, when he walks among us and he, and he says things like, you know, be healed or, uh, or uh, Lazarus come forth and, and all of these words that are so powerful, like he was without sin, cast the first stone. The reason he does these things and heals these people is because he's showing us that God's power is unstoppable. That when God chooses to do something, nothing can come against it. Not a physical ailment like a paralyzed person, not a spiritual problem like the, the man of Gerasene who was possessed by the demons. There's not any type of internal chaos like even Judas betraying him, right? There's nothing and no obstacle that can stop the mission of God. And Jesus goes to the cross and he's not killed. He lays down his life. He's, he's willingly giving his spirit to the Father. Why? Because he's showing us this is what it looks like to fully be alive, to fully be, be empowered, and to give back to the Father in obedience and the love of the Spirit, a, a life that is beautiful and good and true. And so there, he lays down his life for his bride. He fights the serpent and wins. The last Adam defeats sin. Where is your sting? Are you following me? Are you listening? <coughs> We're supposed to be a charismatic group here. There we go. There's an arm. All right. So what happens? What happens? Jesus says, okay, I'm going to go and I'm going to prepare a place for you. I've got everything situated now. I've set it up for your success. I want you to realize how much I love you and you were made to be in communion and union with me. I want you to be one with me. So in order for you not to feel like orphans and to be empowered, I'm going to send the very spirit of God upon you. And this is what's so amazing. The love of God is within us. We are invited into the life of God because of this incredible gift. Look at, look at, look at, look at. The thing that was in the way, sin, with all of its consequences and radical uh, kind of effects, is now eliminated because of Calvary, that work on the cross. But see, it's not just a life of being forgiven. And here, I want to have you be peaceful. It is that, but it's now a work to be done. 
But the work to be done has to overflow from being more than from doing. Are you listening to me? This is a big, a big, big deal. A big deal. We can't spend our time worrying about all the things that we have to do or should be doing. The key, the key is, and the secret is, to be with God. And from that being, we will begin the doing. I want you to think in your mind of, uh, of, a, of a fountain. Uh, not, a, not a lake, not a pond, not even a stream, but a fountain. And you are the vessel. And you, as long as you stay underneath that never-ending flow from the fountain, will be filled to overflowing. The reality is many of you come to these conferences and are entirely depleted. There is nothing within you to give to anyone else because you feel so empty. And ultimately, what you're needing in your life is a refilling to overflowing. But the only way that you can live your life in an effective and a powerful way is to do two things. One is to remember the work of Jesus Christ and what he's done and the reality of the Spirit of God in your life. I want to show you this from actually from a scripture passage because St. Peter, our very first pope, said this. And it was written in uh, his second letter, so if you are looking for it, it's Second Peter, and it's all the way to the right. It's pretty much near the end of the Bible. It's kind of very much close to the book of Revelation, and this is what he said. St. Peter said, his divine power is granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. How many things? Listen to this. His Divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called to us to him his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, that through these, the precious, great promises, through these, you may escape the corruption that is in the world because of passion and become partakers of the divine nature. Now look at, that's what happened at baptism. Everybody is a partaker now of the divine nature. Look at, look at, look at, look at. Everybody has passions in this room. Do you know that? You have passions. Nothing wrong with passions. Passions can be good or they can be disordered. Ordered or disordered passions, right? How do you know which is which? Well, if you you see someone and you think, oh, you know, that's a beautiful person. That's not a disordered passion. But if you see that person and think, I'm going to kill their husband and take her, that's a disordered passion. And there's ways to respond to those. So let's say you have a disordered passion. You're driving and somebody walks really slow in front of your car and you have this desire, I want to run them over. By the way, totally normal desire. And the reality, that disordered passion, now you can respond to it in two ways. One is licit or allowable, and the other is illicit. That's not allowable. So if, in fact, <coughs> you run over that person, for your information, you should be in jail, okay? That's disordered passion, and it's illicitly responded to. This is a very important principle for us because... Because what happens is, is that being invited by God into the very divine life and given these very great and precious promises, we are, are asked to look at ourselves a little bit different than what we originally thought. And so, St. Peter writes and he says, for this very reason, because of the fact that you're baptized and you're invited into all of this goodness, for this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with steadfastness and steadfastness with godliness and godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love. Do you know what those are? Those are the virtues, the cardinal virtues and the theological virtues. So basically saying, look, you're born again, you're followers of Jesus Christ, you're part of him, the life of God is within you, so now live differently and you're going to want to unpack these virtues in your life. Well, then verse 8, he says, For if these things, those virtues, if these things are yours and abound, they keep you from being ineffective and unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. How many of you want to be effective and fruitful when it comes to your relationship with God? Amen. So guess how you do that? I'm going to show you. And I'm just going to read what St. Peter said, our very first pope. If you want to have that, at effectivity, that productivity, you need a person who's growing in virtue. But what if you're struggling with growing in virtue? This is what he says. He goes, whoever lacks these things, these virtuous gifts, cardinal theological virtue, whoever lacks these is blind and short-sighted. Now, you might not like that, but that's the case. If you're struggling with virtue, 
That means that there's an area in your life that you're blinded in and, and you're short-sighted. So in others, you need a clarity of perspective. What is the glasses? What is the remedy to fix your sight? Here it is. You are blind and short-sighted and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. This is insanely awesome because it always comes back to the cross. This is why St. Paul said, I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. This is why he said to the Galatians, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I live, but Christ who lives in me. See, the reality of the cross is it's the reminder that, that I'm new now. I'm different. I'm, the life of God is within me. And so what we do is that following the lead of our elder brother, Jesus, that perfect man who gave the entirety of himself back to the Father in the love of the Spirit, now we are given the opportunity to be set back on track, to be forgiven of original sin and even, right, actual sins. And now, empowered by that very love of God and Spirit of God, we are sent to go into the world and do what? To be fully human. To live what it looks like to be an obedient son and, and daughter in a world that is dark. We're meant to be in the world, but not of the world. We're, we're called, right, and chosen to go and be fulfillers of the Great Commission. Right, Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Judea, Jerusalem, to the ends of the earth. Right, In your here moment, in your little bit of extended outreach, in the entire world. Look, you are called, because of your baptism, to be priest, prophet, and king. That's what Father Dave is talking about. Guess what? To do that, to live an effective and powerful Christian life, you have to remember that you've been forgiven from your sins. And what will that do? That'll help remind you that you, filled with the Spirit of God, can do anything if it's for His glory. Are you listening to me? You are not listening to me. Here's the thing about today. When we talk about the irrepressibility of the Holy Spirit, this idea clicks perfectly in place with seeing all of the work that the Son does and all of the work that the Father had done when you look at the Old Testament. In other words, these principles, and I'm going to give you five, are very much in step with the way that God worked in the Old Testament, the way that God worked in the Gospels, and the way that God works in the New Testament, and the way that God wants to work in you right now. But all of this is connected to the reality of our receptivity of that salvific gift and the receptivity of of the Spirit of God. Are you listening? Here we go. All right, here's the first. The irrepressibility of the Spirit. That's the name of the talk, and we are ready to go now that we are halfway through today. All right, so the first is this. The irrepressibility of the Spirit over natural barriers. And I'm just going to give you examples of these with some scripture references for your own study. The first natural barrier that we have a barrier that we get an example of the work of the Spirit being greater over is language. That very first moment in uh, the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, 6 to 11, each person heard in their own tongue the mighty deeds of God. And that's what it is. They don't hear about some sort sort of intricate, deep theological variable, although these have theological realities, the truth is they talk about the mighty works of God. And each person coming into that area, into Jerusalem that day, heard in their own language the testimony and the witness of what God had done in the Old Testament, and in fact what God had done, obviously, in the life of Jesus himself. And they were so flabbergasted by this because these average Joes and Janes, people who were of no great significance, were speaking languages that would fall in stride and in step with even personal dialects and things that would be very unknown to folks in that area and region. You know, when you travel around the world, you realize that most people know numerous languages. It's only in America that we've specialized in only knowing one. That's a little bit of a cynical uh, look, but, it, but it's kind of true. When I was over in Malaysia a few years ago, uh, honestly, all those kids, not only did they know English, 
but they also knew Chinese, uh, and they each had their own personal dialect, and then there was a primary language in Malaysia that they all would speak. At least four languages were the common reality. I was in the Philippines just recently. Most of those Filipinos can speak numerous languages, a variety of dialects. This is so common and normal. And so for them in that area to hear people speaking those kind of unique, specialized languages was unbelievable. Some assumed that they were drunk. They said, absolutely not, right? We're not drunk as you suppose. We're just filled with the Holy Ghost. All right, so there it is. So the Holy Spirit in that early church, in that moment, that irrepressibility of the Spirit, the first natural barrier, the one thing that should have stopped the going forth of the gospel, the language barrier, is eliminated with the work of the Spirit. Now some of you are a little bit freaked out with everybody speaking in tongues, okay? I get it. It's a little bit strange. I understand. But honestly, it's kind of fascinating that the Word of God is so true then and it's so true now. There have been times and stories of people that I've met and talked to who have been speaking in tongues, and a person next to them said, "Why you're speaking my tribal dialect. How do you know that? And they have no idea. They're just praying in the Spirit. And sometimes we're like, oh my gosh, this sounds a lot like, like gibberish. Is this even a word? I think I've said that word like 14 times. Like, I mean, this can't possibly be right. But see, God, we're talking about all of time, gives to each of us the opportunity to pray in a language, in the spirit that allows for us to worship him sometimes when we don't have the proper intellectual capacity to articulate what we're feeling. And in that moment, being filled with the spirit, Pentecost, right, we have this unfolding of the spirit of God. And what should have been a barrier is no longer a barrier. Another natural barrier in this time would be uh, storms. Remember some of the storms that happened in the Acts of the Apostles. Chapter 27 is a place where there's some storms. Uh, verses 9, 10, and forward. Uh, we could talk about the ways that in that tumultuous storm, right, the whole ship is uh, kind of sinking. The, Paul is stranded now on an island. He's in the water, he says, one time for three days. And you think, my gosh, there's no way this guy will continue to go preach the gospel. But he's in the water for three days. He gets out, and what does he start doing? He starts preaching. I mean, he's just literally unstoppable, not because of himself, but because the Spirit of God was not going to allow any physical obstacle. Look at me, look at look at look at look at so here's the truth. Here's the truth. What are your physical obstacles? You can tell me all you want. Well, I can't really move because my 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 joints are sore. That's a physical obstacle. Maybe you can't speak. Maybe you maybe you're deaf. Maybe you're maybe you're mute. Maybe you basically, you know, whatever, you don't have a tongue. I don't know. I don't know. But whatever that physical obstacle is, God wants to use you to preach the gospel. Look at look at look at. Social media would be a great place for you to slam them with the beauty of the gospel. When all of those people out there are grumping about a politician you don't like, grumping about some sort of movie that they like and you don't like, grumping about this, don't be mean, don't be sarcastic, don't go after them saying, I can't believe you that you're watching that, I can't believe that you like him, I can't believe that you're following that. Just simply go up and just say, man, the Lord today blessed me. You just start showering, you're going to get a whole bunch of people that unfollow you, for sure. And they're probably the people that are driving you crazy. Moving on. Here's the second, the irrepressibility of the spirit over physical barriers. And there's some overlap, so they can do that. So we have natural barriers, here's physical barriers, such as sickness and lameness. There's some examples where there's the widow of name, and uh, remember, if you remember that, Jesus, when he healed the sick, those are examples in the Gospels and the New Testament. You see that the same spirit of God that was with Jesus healing the sick is the same spirit of God with Peter and Paul who are healing the sick in the, in the early church. And that same spirit of God is in you. So there are times that the Lord might ask you to pray for other people with sicknesses. And honestly, that's not, a, that's not a concern and a problem because the Holy Spirit is in the business of working healing still. Now look at, look at, look at. Most of the time, people who have healing ministries are often wearing glasses and are sick themselves. <laughs> Why is that? And the reality is, is that oftentimes they are people who will uh, carry upon them a willingness and a propensity even for suffering uh, and allow that to be in them so that they can pray on behalf of others. Here's a true story. One day I was sitting with a good friend of mine. Uh, he was from this area. Uh, w w this has to be about 19, 20 years ago. And uh, he had, uh, he had uh, kidney 
uh, problems and had already had a replaced kidney, but he had a disease that would attack the new kidney. So he was an amazing person, had a number of kids that were uh, beautiful and um, they would homeschool and they just really were trying to live a very simple and a holy life, but his disease prevented him from doing many things. He couldn't really stack wood and couldn't really pick up his kids too much because of the pain, the physicality and issues. And so we became pretty good friends with them and I loved them very dearly and I still love them. And I remember one day that uh, I was sitting with him and he had scars all over his body. And, and I remember I have scars all over my body because I had open heart surgery. I've had it a couple times and it's just because I was born with a bad heart. And so I remember sitting with him and I said, you know what? I believe God heals. Wouldn't it be amazing if God did a radical healing in us? And we have all of these scars all, all over our body of, of a real, true, physical issue and problem. And yet, if we got healed, then we could go all over and tell people that God has healed. Like, we are literally the perfect poster children of dysfunction physically. And yet, you know, God could do that. And he said this. is what he said to me. He goes, Chris, I believe God can heal too. I do believe that. He said, but, but Jesus, like, he chose to suffer. And somehow, I feel like, for me, that might be the better way. One day, he heard Christmas Eve that he was going to be the recipient of a, of a kidney. He, he screamed at the house, running around, saying, your dad's going to be healed, your dad's going to be healed, uh, kidney. And they went to the hospital, and they had a transplant on Christmas, and um, we were so elated. Such an answer to prayer. A friend of ours had gone to Lourdes and gone swimming in the water and all sorts of stuff for our friend, and we related. I got to go to the hospital after all of this was done and pick him up to bring him home sometime later. And I was so pumped and we were driving home and he's like, I think, I think I have to pee. And we celebrated. We were so excited. He has to pee. I'm going to go pee with you. Let's pee together. And so we went to the, we went to the restroom and we're peeing and it was like, let's order more drinks so we can pee again. And, uh, it was just awesome. And we got home and he ran into the house and threw up and, uh, his body was just trying to figure out what was happening. Um, not too long later, I would take him to the hospital when I could in Pittsburgh. And, and, um, and I remember, I remember uh, he said to me, he said, Chris, I, I gave my body to Jesus a long time ago. I just sometimes I think he overestimates me. And I said, I'll have to quote you on that one day. And, uh, and he said, I don't, think, I don't think the medication's working. And I would take him to the hospital now and then and and then one day, uh, I, I got a call that he was, he was not doing well, and they had taken him into the hospital, and, and, uh, and uh, his wife was there, and the deacon was there, and, and uh, his body started to shut down, and he was going to die. I thought, like, this is not how it's supposed to happen, you know? And uh, his wife, as they were praying the rosary, said, don't you leave me unless Mary comes for you. And she came. I don't, I don't understand sometimes why certain people are healed and why some, some people are not. Here's what I know. There's a beautiful way to die. And some people have had it. And there's been sometimes surprising moments in death. And some people have had that. And God is present in both. I think we should pray with an intensity for healing and, and believe with great confidence because God can heal. But there are occasionally times that he doesn't. And we may never know this side of eternity why. I'm going to tell you one more story. I don't, I don't know why I feel like I need to stay here, but I'm going to. One time, uh, my grandma was blind. I mentioned that last night. I have a, a grandma. Um, she, she was blind and had never seen me most of her life. And uh, she had a detached retina. She was flipping a mattress in a detached. And back in those days, they had some limited surgery abilities. They tried, and eventually too much scar tissue, she would never be able to see. Blind, never saw me, all that stuff, right? Well, I remember as a little tiny boy praying for her healing. Because I re read about it in the Bible. There's so many examples of healing for blindness. I said, Lord, I believe you can heal. And so I, I prayed. And, and, you know, years and years, I prayed all the time. And one day Jesus told me, no. What? I'm a little kid. First, isn't that in my favor? Second, <laughs> she loves you. Like, she's all in for you. I said, why? And he spoke to me, and not out loud, but to my heart. And he said, because I want the first person for her to see to be me. Look, I, I don't know why. I don't think we'll ever understand why people, 
people go when, when we don't want them to go. But I do know that God can heal. And I think tonight there are going to be some people who are healed and then some people who the Lord is going to maybe say no. I don't know. I don't know why. Maybe, maybe I don't have perfect faith, but I just think if everybody lived who we prayed to live, nobody would ever die. And not to be completely insane, but this really isn't the ending place. Like, this is, we're in transit. We're in Philly trying to get somewhere else. <laughs> Please, everybody needs to get out of Philly. All right, so nobody wants to be in there. Somebody's like, we live there. What? Get out. I'm just kidding, just kidding. So we have irrepressibility of the spirit over natural barriers, over physical barriers. And uh, here's the third, spirituality, uh, in irrepressibility of the spirit over supernatural barriers. This is a big deal. Uh, there's a number of examples in the Acts of the Apostles, Acts chapter 10, 38, where Jesus heals those that are oppressed by the devil. Uh, you have... Uh, some Simon the Magician, chapter 8, verses 9 and following. Uh, in Egyptian, uh, you have the Egyptian priests that were against um, Moses and uh, Jesus. You can look at that in the Gospels. But Sons of Sceva, that's in the Acts of the Apostles. People don't know a lot about that. 19, chapter 19. Uh, Jesus, uh, you could look in the um, Gospels about him having victory over the demoniacs. But, uh, another example of the irrepressibility of the spirit over supernatural barriers is idolatry when uh, they call Barnabas, Zeus, and Paul Hermes in chapter 14, verse 12. When you look at the scriptures, you realize there's a lot of reasons, again, why the, the gospel message wouldn't be able to make it out. There's physical limitations. There's, there's, there's natural problems, storms and the like. You have, you have spiritual adversaries that are at work. How can you possibly have an effectivity in preaching the gospel when you have all those things against you? But each of the examples that are given, there is victory. And in that moment of victory, the gospel is preached. That's what I love. And so, again, here's the truth. My friend passed away. But I have told that story a number of times, and people have been transformed by his life and his death. And that's the goal, is that even death has no sting when it comes to the impact of the gospel. The gospel will go out, and honestly, it's a powerful opportunity that we have to realize the beginning, the middle, and the end, if we place it in the hands of God, can be redemptive. So we have that. Let's look at, there's only two more, and I'm going to uh, try to do that. We'll pray, and if we have time for questions, we'll do questions. Here's the third, uh, fourth, rather. Uh, so we have the irrepressibility of the spirit over natural barriers, over physical barriers, number two, over supernatural barriers, number three, irrepressibility of the spirit over religious differences. This is very applicable in the Acts of the Apostles. You have struggles with Jews at Antioch and Iconium, chapter 13. Uh, they stone Paul. Uh, and, and he gets up and he goes and he preaches the gospel. <laughs> That's awesome. And uh, <laughs> I mean, come on. You have uh, opposition with Caesar and Rome, if you remember that. That's pretty intense. You have the Pharisees and Sadducees, of course, that are still angry and trying to resist the, the gospel. You have sorcerers, chapter 13, 6 to 11. Elymas, the magician, in chapter 16. And you have the synagogue of the freedmen, chapter 6. Basically, if you just went through the Acts of the Apostles, or you can get the book, no pressure, uh, basically, you'll have some of these scriptures and examples because what you begin to realize is that, look, all of the things that we struggle with today are the things that they struggled with back then. I guess partly what it comes down to is some people feel like, I really need to learn more, I need to get more fired up for God, I need to really get rid of some of these obstacles and difficulties and struggles, and then I can go and really be effective for preaching and teaching and doing good things for God. No, 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 no. No, you right now are ministers. You right now are called to be priests, prophets, and kings when it comes to all that that entails. You are called to be a part of presenting and dealing with, right, people around you in the Great Commission. Are you picking up what I'm throwing down? Are you listening to me? Are you sleeping? I'm fatter than most of you. I will come out there and I will sit on your legs and break them for Jesus. Do you understand? And then we'll pray for healing. We'll pray for healing. Gosh. All right, here we go. The last one, the irrepressibility of the spirit over internal differences. And I love this. It's very helpful when we feel division sometimes and the church struggles, even in our family. Paul, Luke, Barnabas, Mark, you would think these people who are saints would have the perfect relationship dynamic, but they struggled. There were times that they didn't want to go on mission together. Uh, <laughs> you have the Greek inclusion. What do we do with all of these Greeks who want to come be and become, become uh, you know, followers of Jesus now? What are, what are the consequences? What are the results? And 
and uh, the Council of Jerusalem, chapter 4, verse 15, and of course the great story of Ananias and Sapphira, who they had chosen intentionally to lie to the Holy Spirit. They're struck dead, and boy, oh boy, that that changed the dynamic of that church. So think about that when we ask you for money later. But here's the thing. <laughs> Just kidding. Not the same. It's a simple truth. Jesus loves you. You probably heard a song like that when you were a little kid. Jesus loves you, this I know. For the Bible and sacred tradition tell me so. Little ones dim belong. There we, we used to talk. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible and sacred tradition tell me so. Just going to Catholic all of my little old Protestant songs. <laughs> the truth, you can think of a million reasons why God couldn't use you, but he sees you and he already made the decision that he wants to be with you. And he wants to do something great in you and to you and through you. Maybe, maybe what this comes down to is that we just don't think about what we've been given and what we have. If you focus on the cross and you just keep looking at that cross, that's going to open up your eyes to see clearly. And then you realize, wow, that's not just for me, but that's for others. And that gives you a desire, a desire to see something happen. But then you feel insecure and you feel weak and you feel unfit for the task. You feel like you can't, but then that's where the Holy Spirit empowers you. You don't have to feel, you just have to walk. You have to do because he's already with you. He's in you. Maybe you feel insecure. Well, then ask him. Come, Holy Spirit, I need your help. Give me courage. Give me strength. Like, I'm not sure what to say. Well, then just pray. Pray in the Spirit. Maybe not out loud as you're walking in the middle of the street, because that would be probably a little weird for some people. What are you doing? Are you all right? Just filled with the Spirit. Sometimes somebody might come up and say, what are you doing? I'm praying. What are you praying about? And then you can say, you. <laughs> That's what a little friar on the campus used to always say to me. I'd be like, what are you learning? What's God talking to you about, Father Gus? And he'd be like, you. And I'm thinking, well, okay, that's weird. But uh, thank you. I think about the Holy Spirit a lot. And this is true because I went to a charismatic church when I was a little kid. Protestant. I grew up Protestant. I became Catholic Easter of 1999. Uh, I remember watching people fall all over the place in that church. The Holy Spirit's breath was intense. Let's just say that. He was blowing hard, okay? <laughs> People were all over. And, you know, I could repeat to you verbatim the pastor's wife's prayer language. She said it so much. I know it. I know it like by heart. I remember praying as a kid all the time, God, if you want to give me the Holy Spirit and, and speak in tongues and all that, I, I'm open to that. But it, it never happened for me. And I felt, at some point I felt, Maybe it's just sin, and so I would spend all this time like, Lord, what have I done? How have I offended you? What have I done? And I would just agonize over it, and I kept thinking it would be different. I remember I read a story about a guy who was filled with the Spirit, and he couldn't speak English for like three days. I wanted that, but it, it wasn't that. I could say some stuff, but it just sounded weird. It didn't sound like it was anything holy. I didn't feel holy when I started speaking like that. I thought, well, maybe I've done something wrong. There's so many ways the enemy plays with your brain. So I got to be a teenager. I made a lot of mistakes, and so I realized I've done a lot of things wrong. There's no way the Holy Spirit would want to do something with me, in me, through me. And then he was merciful to me, and I would come back to him. See, the thing about it is that there's, there's a million ways that the enemy has strategized to keep you from being powerful. And I don't know what it is for you, but I know for me as a little kid, it was you, you couldn't possibly be worthy of that. You couldn't possibly be that special to receive that gift. You obviously have something wrong with you. But as I got older and I realized, wait a minute, he did give me that gift. I, I just, I could make the choice. I had the choice to, to, to pray, to walk in it or not. God wasn't going to force me to, to, to move forward in a spiritual relationship. He was going to invite me, and I had to have a little bit of faith and step forward. I remember once I said to the Lord, I said, I don't know if all I'm saying is gibberish like a little child, but at least you know my heart's right. So here we go. I think sometimes the enemy will come to you, and he'll give you that one thing that would probably give you the hesitancy in your step. And maybe it might be, well, your kids have fallen away from the faith. Why would you tell somebody else about the faith? Or maybe it's, you know, you have some secret sins that you haven't talked about. 
Or maybe it's been you haven't gone to confession in a year. Or maybe it's been you're basically old. How could you possibly have anything to say to young people? Or maybe it's and fill in the blank. Like there's so many ways the enemy looks at you and he says no. But remember the irrepressibility of the spirit over supernatural things. In those moments you say by the spirit of God, by this truth, I believe that God you want me to have victory to move forward. And you move and you don't have necessarily an emotion that goes with it. You choose to walk in that spirit. I pray in the spirit as much as I can. And I love it because I have no idea really what I'm saying, but I know that my heart is aching at times and I just want to give it to him. But I don't often pray it out loud in a microphone because I don't think I have that spiritual gift where someone's going to interpret it. Maybe it'll happen for me one day. Maybe it won't. But right now I know this. I know I can make people laugh. And I know I can befriend and I can love folks that are not like me. I know I can live the gospel even at times without saying words. I know that I can, I can care about someone, bring them food and drink. I know that I can be a light in darkness. I know that with all of my dysfunctions, he is greatly functioning through me. And the truth is, that's your hope too. The irrepressibility of the Spirit is just a simple truth. God has chosen for you to be here in space and time on purpose. You're not an accident. And he's invited you into the walk, this beautiful journey where you get to be with him and he gets to be with you. And you know what? When you look in the mirror and you're not sure that it's exactly the way that you wanted it to be, breathe a sigh of relief because his plan is better than your plan. Let's pray. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Jesus, thank you for the way you love us. What I want to do is just simply uh, pray that song for the last little bit. And I just want you to think about the ways that the enemy lies to you and keeps you from walking in the Spirit. Maybe, Maybe you've prayed for the gift of tongues and you have yet to receive that I want you to look at me just be open okay just pray Jesus I'm open and just kind of flow with it experiment you're like a little child it's like a little baby it's so beautiful in a way to watch a little baby try to speak for the first time do they automatically speak perfect English no that's creepy that's in like horror stories so God's not looking at you saying, well, you better do it right or I'm coming. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Jesus, we love you. We ask you would teach us how to be with you. Come away. Oh, come away to this quiet place. I'll steal the day and I'll look at you. And you, you, you can look at me, it won't be alright. Come away, oh come away to this quiet place. I'll steal the day, and I'll look at you, and you, you, you can look at me. Son of 
three announcements, if that's okay. I don't know if we have a lot of time. But... Okay, real quick. Uh, I have a lot of, I'll have a lot of books that I've written over the years. A couple are very special to me, I think that would be applicable. One that I know is over there is called, I'm not okay, you're not okay, but it's okay. And I wrote that for you, because clearly you're not okay. But neither am I. Maybe some of you are struggling. I know that Mary talked a lot about those insecure feelings and frustrations. We haven't talked a lot about it. Maybe tonight we'll play with this a little bit more, but the impact of our parents and how that affects how we look at faith and family. But uh, that book kind of delves into a lot of that stuff. I think it's important. Second one is the one I've referenced a couple times, the um, irrepressibility of the Holy Spirit's in here. Uh, it just goes kind of basically right from the beginning to the end in the Acts of the Apostles. There's not a lot of copies of this book, to be real honest. I think it only brought about, I don't know, 30 to 50, but uh, there, there's more online, and um, I can send more here, but whatever. We, why we need the Holy Spirit. Uh, I wrote this a couple years ago, and when I got to this section dealing with tongues, I had to stop because I knew that I couldn't do that justice. So I'm working on a book right now, Why We Need the Gifts of the Spirit, which I hope to put out in the next year or so, which will not only just address the gift of tongues, but the idea of a prayer language and, and other gifts that we don't talk about a lot, because there's actually a lot more gifts than just speaking in tongues. The truth is, is that God is giving you a lot of gifts and talents to share the gospel, and I can't wait to hear about it. Uh, I do a lot of social media stuff. Some of you have already found me on Twitter and Instagram, and I love interacting with you, keeping in touch with you. So I'm going to tell you a couple, see if we can remember. Uh, what's my name? Chris Paget. If you put it together, lowercase, that's Instagram. Chris with the M for Michael, that's my middle name. Chris M. Paget is Twitter. If you go to Happy Place Homestead, you see all the funny videos of my family. That's going to be awesome because we're doing truckloads of stuff right now. And um, I'm a bookaholic, so I'm just going to say this. I love books. I read constantly, and I read a ton of stuff, not just spiritual stuff, lots. I just read uh, The Great Alone by Kristen Hanna. I just finished All the Light We Cannot See uh, by Dora. That was amazing. So uh, I have a uh, Instagram and a Facebook page called The Bookaholic. You might have to put a one after The Bookaholic, but, but it's, uh, you should be able to find me there. And I love talking about books. So if you're a book nerd, I'd like to talk to you.